<laughs> okay, now I'm recording. Okay, so we just went over a, a simple game that you can play at home in High Sakella, uh, rock, paper, scissors in High Sakella. That's Asim, Apti, Tanayu. Asim, Apti, Tanayu. Asim, Apti, Tanayu. Asim, Apti, Tanayu. So yeah, just a fun game that you can play at home, your family, friends. Uh, next, um, I'd ask for everyone to have on hand uh, Kati <laughs> paper. Um, oh, I can't think of the word for pencil right now. Um, but paper pencil. You. What was that, Ab? Kedayu. Kedayu. So if you have a paper, pencil, and a ruler on hand, I'm just gonna share my screen with you because this next part is going to help us and help you make your own notes at home for the videos that Ab is doing on the vocal track map and the regular vowels. So I'm gonna share the screen with you. Just It's just a tutorial on how to draw the vocal track map. So um, I just wanna give everyone time to grab a paper, pencil, and a ruler. And for starters, you're gonna draw about a six inch line going down the right hand side of your paper. It's too bad I can't see everyone, then I could know when you guys are ready to go. Um, I'll just share this screen now. <clears throat> What did you say? Paper, pen, pencil, what? And a ruler. Ruler, pencil, and a paper? Yes. Okay. Beans. Okay, can you guys all see the screen? My screen? Oh, and I guess I should check to see if I want to be sure that you guys can hear my volume too. Um, okay. It's honestly not letting me open the screen right up so I can make sure that I'm sharing my the sound with you guys as well. Sorry guys, just give me a second. Okay, there we go. Okay, sorry about that, guys. Here we go. Now it's not going to let me show it. All right, I lost the video. Let me grab it. Okay, here we go. Sorry about that, guys. <clears throat> and first, down the right-hand side of your paper, you're going to draw 
the line. This will be the bottom part of your paper. And we'll do that line in about three and a half inches. <clears throat> we'll go about five and a half inches at the top of your paper. Now we're going to connect this top line here to this bottom line here. Now you're just going to line up the edge of the ruler with this outer line here. So it looks like it's about dividing this bottom line in half, approximately. Draw a line down there. And then you're gonna section this off into three different sections. So. So in the top left corner, you're going to write the letter I. In this top right corner, you're going to write the letter U. In the middle of this, in the middle of this section here, you're going to write the letter E. And on this side, in the middle, you're going to write the letter AU. The top left corner of this section here, you're going to write AI. And down in the bottom right corner here, you're going to write AA and A. Now, Hold tight to this uh, drawing that you've just completed because you'll need it to um, write down your own notes for the video I'm going to share with you next. Wah. Okay, so did you guys get your um, get your charts drawn out? Okay, cool. Um, now I'm going to be showing um, two other videos. One will be on the vocal track map and focusing on regular vowels. And um, why I got you to draw out the, that map is because for, for me personally, after I went through it and drew out my own to have at home, I was able to write my own notes alongside what Ab is teaching in these videos. And it really gave me a better understanding on what, um, what he's teaching and the importance of it. So, um, yeah, so Shelly, you might have to go back and review this after, but I just had everyone draw out this shape here so that they can take notes with uh, the next video I'll be showing with Ab's teachings of the vocal trap uh, map in regards to regular vowels. Um, so I'll share that one again with you after Shelly and um, you can draw out this map. Actually, you know what, you might have a copy in our office and a lot of us do have copies of the materials that Ab has created. So you might not even have to redraw this. He, you might have a copy in your office somewhere. This is for people, um, this is for people like uh, at home who we don't have these resources out to just yet. Okay, okay so uh, I'm going to share um, two videos. One is, um, Ab's first video explaining regular vowels, and the second is a updated version of that video that he's recently created with Vera uh, giving examples of those vowels in her video. 
So the first one I'm going to show is the very first video that Ab created around regular valves. And Crystal, I will send you um, copies that you can have at the desk. And I think what we'll do to get as well too is we'll put together some resources with the vocal track map that track map that can be downloaded from our website or um, shared at the front desk for people to participate from home too. Okay. So here's, oh, this is the second video. Okay, so yeah, this is where it will be helpful to follow along and take, take your own notes. There are two types of vowels used in high Kella. In this video, I'm going to talk about regular vowels. So first, we have our vocal tract here, which we saw in the previous video. What I'm going to do here is create kind of a chart. inside the mouth. So this will give us an idea of where the sounds are coming from when we're making vowel sounds in Heisler So the first sound is represented by the letter I. I actually makes an E sound. Kind of like in the word pizza in English. One way you can uh, check as to where the sound is coming from is you can make the sound breathing out and then keep your mouth in the same position and then breathe in. So if you go e, e, when you breathe in the air is a little bit colder so you should feel the air kind of hitting around this area of your mouth towards the front and the upper part of your mouth. So I makes an E sound. Next here in the middle, we have an E. This E is what we refer to as a schwa. Sometimes it's spelled with a C, but most of the time you'll see it spelled S-H-W-A. So a schwa does not really have a sound of its own. It's a sound that can change. And the most common sound that you'll hear is an a uh sound, like in the word up. Another sound you might hear is uh, as in the word book. You also might hear kind of an i uh sound as in the word kit. You could also hear the schwa making an oo uh sound, like in the word roof. So those are the main sounds that you will hear. It depends on what's around the E. The next letter is actually a combination of letters. This is the letter A and the I together. These make an E sound like in the word met in English. Up here in uh, the back part of your mouth, towards the top, we have a U. The U 
and Heisler Keller sounds like ooh, as in the word roof. Or another example could be tuba. Working our way down, we have another letter combination. We have an A and a U together. These two letters combine to make an O sound. So an example of that in English is the word boat. Down here in this bottom quadrant, bottom section here, we have an A. A is a letter that has a couple of different sounds. You might hear kind of an A ah sound or an A ah sound. So it could sound like the A in cat. It could also sound like the O in cot. We also have, just above it, two A's together. So this is basically a long A. So it's the same as the short A here. This is a short A. It makes the same sounds as the short A does, but it's a little bit longer. So this might sound like a ah or a. Ah. Two A's together would sound like ah. Uh, I'm exaggerating that a little bit uh, just to kind of show the difference between them. It's not going to be quite that long usually, but there will be just a, you will hold on to this A sound a little bit longer when you see those two A's together. So I used English words to start with, just to give you an, a, an idea of how these vowels actually sound. So I think it'll help to use English words which you are familiar with already. So just to review, I is toward the front of your mouth and more to the top of your mouth. I makes an E sound like pizza. U makes an oo sound like tuba. AI makes an e sound like met. The schwa can sound like a uh, and up, can sound like the u uh, and book, can sound like e and kit, can sound like u and roof. U can sound like u and tuba. A, U together sounds like O and boat. The single A is a short A, can sound like cat or cot. And two A's side by side is a long A. The same sound as the short A, but you hold on to it a little bit longer. So we have E, U, E. A, O, E, U. We also have an U here. We have O, A or A, and A. In the next video, we will talk about retracted vowels. Wah. So the next video I'm going to show follows right along with this video we just watched, only it's a little bit more in depth um, with examples of regular vowels that Vera is sharing at the very beginning of the video and Ab kind of going back into the mechanics of those um, sounds afterwards. So this is about another like eight, nine minute video on regular vowels. You can add your notes here as well too because he has different notes 
from the previous video on regular vowels. Alke. Alke. Kala. Kala. Kah. Kah. Me. Me. O. O. Hamsa. Hamsa. Bukwis, bukwis, kilasu, kilasu, chuyu, chuyu, geek, geek, duhua, duhua. In this video, we're going to talk about regular vowels. So first off, I'm going to draw a little chart. So if you can just imagine this is the inside of your mouth. Here we have the front part of your mouth. There we have the back. And we have different sections. Um, down here we have the bottom of our mouth towards the front, the bottom of our mouth towards the back. These lines basically kind of show you how high your tongue goes in your mouth when you make a vowel sound. So the first vowel that we have is an I. So the vowel sound I makes more of an E sound. So an example of that in Haislakela is the word geek, which is tooth. So this is a tooth here. So you can see the placement of the of the eye here. When you make an E sound, your tongue is coming up towards the roof of your mouth and the air is coming out from your throat. It's being uh, forced out over top of your tongue and then coming out of your mouth. So if you breathe out and make the E sound like E and then hold your breath and breathe in while holding your mouth the same way, you'll feel where the, where the air hits. So if you go E, E, you'll feel the air hitting somewhere around here. Towards the back of our mouth, we have the letter U. So U makes an OO sound. And an example of that in Haislakela is the word Dukwa. And Dukwa is stinging metal. So you hear the OO sound there, Dukwa. The next letter we have is the letter E. So E can have a lot of different sounds depending on what's around it. So you could hear an A uh sound like in the word Hamsa. Um, I think I'll just write this here. Hamsa. That means eat. It might make an O uh sound, like in the word bukwis. Which means wild man of the woods. It might make an I uh sound, like kilasu. Kilasu means to be called something. It might make kind of an oo sound, like tu yu. So you can see a lot of different sounds that it could make. The most common one is probably this one here. It makes kind of a ah uh sound. So it might sound like the ah uh in hamsa, 
might sound like the oh m bukwas. It might sound like the eh in kilasu. It might sound like the u and tsuyu. So tsuyu means dried, something that is dried. We also down here have the letter combination of AI. So this makes an eh sound. And what we can use as an, as an example of that is the word me. So me is something that you ask somebody if you didn't understand what they said. Me basically means what. So that eh sound is called, caused by this combination of the A and the I together. AI makes eh, like meh. And then back here, we have the letter combination of A and U. So when you have an A and a U together, side by side like this, it makes an O sound. So in high is the kyala. You'll hear that in the word O, which means father. We also have a single A. So when you see an A by itself, there's a couple of different sounds that it could make. It could sound like A, like in the word Alkia. Alkia means stop. So you hear kind of an ah sound at the end there. It could also sound like ah, like in the word kala. Kala means no, as in to know something. So a could sound like the ah in alkia could sound like the A ah in Kala. And then the last combination that we have, you could see two A's together. When you see this, it makes the same sound as the A, the single A by itself. The difference is it's a little bit longer. So in the word gach, which means raven. You see there's two A's together. So it's making the A ah sound like in kala, which is a shorter sound, kala. Two A's together, it's the same as that, but it's a little bit longer, gach. So those are regular vowel sounds. In the next video, we will talk about retracted vowels. Wa. Okay. <clears throat> so I find those videos to be very helpful. Um, and after watching them and watching them over and over again to develop what we created for today's lessons, it's really helped me um, remember where, like, what all those letter combinations sound like and how they're pronounced. Um, I now know what a schwa is. <laughs> and I know that the technical terms can be very intimidating for people. So, uh, we are trying to work together as a team to create something that's, you know, that makes our language a little more approachable. But I, what I really found was that once getting this, uh, this little diagram written out or drawn out and making my own notes that really helped, like, you know, solidify my understanding of what Ab is teaching in those videos, 
especially when you describe how this is just showing the pitches and the levels of where those uh, sounds come from. <coughs> I, I was, um, thanks to my sister Crystal, she's been my guinea pig for <laughs> for like practicing the the language the language and even just trying to learn it myself so I can share it as well and teach. So I was holding the this chart up like this, like aligned with my my um, where my vocal tract would be. Um, does anyone have any questions about that before we go on to the next part with? Um, we're, we're just going to go over some of those words and give more examples about those um, those sounds and letters. So if anyone has any questions, we do have Ab here and I'll, I'll try answer to the best of my understanding as well too, but Ab's have a, has had a lot more time to study the orthography. So now would be a perfect opportunity to, to ask questions. Um, start off with Dustin. You might have to unmute your own mic. Um, there we go. Okay. It was uh, not a question, but the word baguas, I thought it would be very interesting for people to know. It goes from the north tip of Alaska all the way down to Southern California. The word baguas has the same meaning, but a little bit of difference in different uh, cultures that you go to. Some of them mean uh, little people. So that word baguas, what I thought was very interesting is that we can't go talk to our neighbors because of our dialect, but the same common word for the same creature or whatever you want to call it, I, I, I interpret it as Sasquatch basically, goes from Alaska down to Southern California. That interests me so much because of the same word for the same thing in all different languages. I just thought that would be neat for people to hear. <laughs> that's a great and that's really cool because uh, there's there's similarities with our language all, like all up and down the coast and it makes me wonder if it's part of like Chinook jargon maybe or something that was shared as like a common word and it's also interchangeably used now uh, as representing monkey <laughs> um, and I know for for us particularly it means wild man, like someone who's gone wild in the woods type of um, explanation there. And same thing with, um, with gumswa. That's another word that's kind of all over, like up and down the coast, the same, same word, but um, they have different meanings, which is pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah that sorry for jumping in that word i was sitting with granny b and my granny edith when my baba dan passed away we were doing a traditional burn for him and they started telling me the origins of gumswa so when you take a rock to the water and you toss it in a pond it goes Kum. and then the squaw was the seagulls when the seagulls would fly over the white caps you'd see their white heads go up and down so the way they interpreted it, um, we had canoes where we couldn't go underneath. So when they saw the Goomswa's head go underneath, that's how they named it, un their white heads going under the water. That's what Granny B and my Granny Edith told me. And then up in the Nass, um, my girlfriend told me that theirs means the white driftwood going up and down. So I thought that was pretty interesting. I just wanted to share what I knew about that word. <laughs> Simshian has a similar definition to Niska uh, where they it means driftwood, but um, the the definition I heard or the translation I heard was um, doesn't have roots here. I thought it was, I thought it was really interesting, but it's a, I think it's neat to share those commonalities that we have within our language that it, that are like common words all up and down the coast. But that's a that's a good observation. Um, just. I've analyzed the, uh, I've done like a linguistic analysis of a lot of words and bukwus is basically uh, an extension of book and book means human. So the bukwus means a wild man in the woods and um, I think bukwe means body and baguana means person and it's the addition of the um, suffixes that change the, the last letter in the root, and that changes the meaning. But um, that's something I found in terms of, and when I've 
done my studies of language. And the other thing I wanted to say about the video is that I did actually mispronounce a few words. Um, that's at one point I, I said tu yu. Um, that's not the proper way to uh, to say it. It's just tu yu. And um, I know how it's supposed to be said, but for some reason, when I'm shooting video or sometimes it just comes out like that. And I said it once, and then I kept saying it, and I didn't catch it when I was actually recording. So. Um, I've actually found recording these videos kind of difficult. Um, things like that, that do tend to happen and I'm, I don't realize that I'm doing it. I don't, don't realize that I'm mispronouncing words sometimes and um, it, it just happens. So whenever I'm editing my videos, I catch those mistakes and I usually uh, make some kind of, um, I add a subtitle there just to show people that uh, there was a there's an error made on my part. And um, I also made a mistake when I was writing out the word book was, it's supposed to be, there's supposed to be a little apostrophe over the K. I just wrote a plain K. So it's little things like that just to be aware of. And um, my area of specialty is really the written language. And the, like the pronunciation is coming a little slower for me. So that's something I'm still working on. And um, basically, um, I kind of re-recorded re it because I wanted to have Heisler words as examples, and I thought that would help a little bit more than using English. So when I re-recorded the video, I kind of meant it to kind of um, like replace the English one, but if the English examples work as well, I think that might be, uh, might be something that I'll, I'll continue doing, and maybe we can just show both of them at the same time, because it might help people just to get an idea, like this is how it sounds in English, and then this is how it sounds in Heisler killing. I, I actually personally really liked both of them. And last minute, I was I was going to only show the last video that you uploaded. And um, but at the same time, I feel that for us who read and write in English, the giving the English examples definitely does help, and also helps us connect what we know in High Sagella to that comparison. I think I think they're both really helpful and and useful. Um, so does anyone else have any questions or comments before we move on to the next part? It's, it's just sharing um, more examples of the words. And what I particularly want people to pay attention to is just, just the sounds that they create because the, I tried to choose words that people would be familiar with or might have heard their grandparent or parent speaking them before because that might, you know, I think it really helps hit those, you know, lessons home and Sometimes I think we don't realize how much we actually, how much Heisler we actually have present in our lives until we actually hear the words being said again, or uh, until you hear the word or see the word, um, and then you kind of recognize it. Like I was saying that to my mom the other day. I didn't realize how much Heisler my mom used in our lives growing up, and how much I understood. Um, there are some words that I actually thought were actually English. One of them was uh, parents and I bring me my scissors <laughs> and I just go and grab her her scissors and and it was wasn't a second thought but I didn't realize how present language was in in our home until I started relearning it again so anyway I'm going to be sharing uh, word examples and for you at home um, this is what really helps me like after learning the different sounds, like, oh, the I sounds like uh, the E in pizza. So I started breaking those sounds down and I was going, E, ooh, oh, A. And I kept repeating those sounds. And it, it does sound silly when you first start practicing them, but I started doing that with all the high Ella sounds because it started training my vocal, my vocal tract to be able to properly pronounce those sounds. So I encourage you to do the same at home um, as we go through this video and draw out those sounds that you'll, you'll hear in the, the word list. Um, I was hoping Vera would be here to, pronounce, to help pronounce these words, but I, I'm fairly confident in um, my pronunciations of them. But um, Ab, if if you and many or anyone else, if if I'm mispronouncing something and you want to share the proper pronunciation, feel free to unmute yourself and 
and uh, share what you think the proper pronunciation is because we're going to be relying on each other right now without the without our fluent speaker with us today so So regular vowel sound I, kibat, kibat, kibat. I did try to include a phonetic spelling, but it's something that we need to standardize as well too. So this is just my um, my own phonetic spelling, kibat, elderberry, tihua, tihua. Tihua, wild crab apple. Kig, kig, teeth, kig. Weesum, weesum, boy or man, weesum. Sikya, sikya. Regular vowel sound E to spear. Sikya. Sims. 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 Me. Me, what, pardon, me, la la guade, la la guade, butterfly, la la guade, me, me, small or little. Ame. Bakwe. Bakwe. Body self. Bakwe. Duhua. Duhua. Stingy metal. Duhua. It's regular vowel sound U. Duhua. Puas, puas, hungry, puas, puas, puas. There, puas. There's the uh, apostrophe. Basically, means you kind of catch your breath after the first two letters. So puas, 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 puas. I'm hungry. I was worried about you guys hearing my stomach growl. Puas. <laughs> you. You. No. You. Regular vowel sound A U. Op. Op. Father. Op. Cloch. Cloch. Strong. Cloch. Alos. Alos. Dried salmon strips. Alos. Ala, ala, no. It's regular vowel sound A, ala. You might recognize hearing people say, kyung ala, I don't know, or ala nugwa, I know. Ala. Kachla, kachla. 
walk. Kahla. 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 That one's a bit tougher. It's the the barred L. It's, you put your the tip of your tongue against your the little bump behind your teeth, and then you blow the air around the side of your tongue. Kahla. Kahla. You're you're making more of a sound. That's an that's an X kind of sound. This is kahla. I need a bit more practice on that one. Thanks, Ab. Allah. Allah. That's that popped P sound, but we're focusing on the A sound. Allah. Work. Here's a double A sound. Gah. Gah. Raven. Gah. 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 Bone. Gah. Lotwis. Lotwis. To go across. Lotwis. So um, that kind of shows you like the sounds and the, I'm not sure if you could draw out those sounds that were shown there. Um, but for me, that really helps with that teaching is understanding like, oh, those, were, those are where some of those sounds come from. Like the key butt in the I, the letter I, key butt. Um, the A-U, O, and the double A lot lease and the the oo sound in duhua. So those are all really um, things that really helped me. Just one second. Bear with me one minute, guys. I'm just going to try to get Vera to join us. She was trying to sign in, but I couldn't see her. So just give me one second. Well, but if anyone has any questions, now would be a great time to ask. Um, Ask Ab or any one of us. If you're shy to ask questions, you can type them out too and we'll we'll get to them. Uh, something else I wanted to share with everybody is I've been thinking a lot about how we make sounds uh, in our language and a lot of it has to do with how like the, the, the airflow that's coming out of your mouth. And it's kind of hard to show um, how the air is coming out when somebody's just speaking. Uh, even if you watch their mouth, it can be sometimes tricky to uh, try and decipher what kind of sound they're making. So I came up, I designed my own little tool here. And it just, it's designed to basically, whenever I, I breathe out, you can see that it, it moves. So. I can go through some of the words that uh, were just in the video that I made. So the first one is Alkia. Alkia. The next word, Kala. Kala. Gah. Gah. Me. Me. Oh. Oh, Hamsa, Hamsa, Bakwas, Bakwas, Kilasu, Kilasu, Tuyu, Tuyu, 
Geek. Geek. Duhwa. Duhwa. So hopefully that helps in terms of visualizing how the air comes out. I find it really helps with tuyu. Uh, because you can look at my, my mouth when I say like tuyu. But uh, you can see that my lips are rounding. But when I hold this in front of my mouth, tuyu. Tuyu. You can see that I'm, as I'm rounding my lips, I'm also blowing out air. And it's kind of hard to hear that when it's at the end of a word like that. But when you have something to kind of show with the airflow like this, to you, to you. So hopefully that, that helps people. Great. Um, moving on. Um, we are going to share a story today, the Heisler Nuyum um, from the Heisler We Are History book. And today's story is why the beaver, raven, and the blackfish salmon clans act together in feasts as told by Joan Howard, 1935. So our, um, our summer student, Megan Metz, has volunteered to read that story for us today. Thank you, Megan. Um, so I'll mute my mic and I'll let her uh, share this story with you. Okay. Hi, everyone. So Teresa already said the title of the story and who told it, so I'm just gonna jump right into it. When Hanklikolas and his followers first arrived at the mouth of the Kitimat River, there were few of them, but it wasn't very long before people from other tribes started to come and join them. The first group was a party of Simshian that Hanklikolas encountered when he noticed a willow stick floating down the river. It was peeled and when he examined it closely, he noticed that it had not been peeled by a beaver, but by a person. So he pulled up the river as far as Nalabila. There he found a band of Simshans. Their chief was Simdik of the Raven clan. They decided to join Hanklikolas and his followers. There were huckleberries on the mountainside above the people's camp. While the berries were ripe and being picked, the chief would go up each afternoon and blackened the sides of the baskets with ash so that they would not be easily seen by raiding canoes. Even back then, there were raiding parties looking for slaves and booty. The word was spreading that the settlement on the river was a rich place full of fish, game, and growing things. People from outside started to come in hope of joining the group. Hanglikolas would send his nephew down to the water to meet the new arrivals and look them over. Those who looked handsome and loyal Hanklikolas would paint their faces with the eagle crest. Those he did not like, he made slaves. These slaves kept multiplying until he was rich. For many years, things went well, but trouble was to come. Trouble arose between the eagles and the ravens, but the eagles won easily in a single preemptive raid on the raven settlement. And things became well again and stayed calm for a long time. Hanklikolas became an old, old man and a rich chief with many names. The village was very large, but trouble came again between the ravens and the eagles. This time, Hanklikolas was killed. None of the eagles could take his place in battle and the eagles lost. Actually, the ravens had enlisted the help of the beavers in this war, and that was sufficient to allow the ravens to win. Some eagles were tied on house posts upside down. The wife of one of the eagle chiefs asked the raven chief to let them go saying the ravens could take over all the rights of the eagles. He let them go, but the eagles were allowed to keep the river and the names of the chiefs. That was how the ravens and eagles became such rivals. Here's how the ravens and beaver clan came to be partners and work together in ceremonies. Years later, a raven chief became, became very angry at his nephew. His nephew should have been his heir according to Heisla traditional inheritance, which passes through the female line rather than from father to son. And because that raven chief was so angry, he gave his son, who was a beaver, the raven rights on the river. That's how the beaver chief, Jesse, became the chief with rights to the lower Kitimat River. Such a thing should never have happened. Even in those early days, fathers left their names to their nephews. These days, some Heislas don't understand our ways and use Gomsua thinking, by which fathers leave their names, trap lines, and possessions to their son. According to our new young, a man's inheritance should go to his oldest sister's son, 
So that's how the beavers and ravens started working together as a unit. Some Haislas believe that there was also a crow clan among the Kitimat and Hanaxila people, and that the crow clan were also linked with the ravens and beavers. If there was a crow clan, it's now gone. Well, we don't know for sure why and when the fish clan and blackfish or killer whale clan started working together. Some elders were told that after the epidemics in the 1918 flu, there were so few people left in order to survive, the fish and blackfish clan started working together as a unit. The eagles are the only clan that works by itself. Here's how the clans are linked among the high slits. And then the clans are listed here. Ixtuquienich, eagle clan, Gitzor, and under it it says beaver, raven, and the crow if they existed. And Miminich, killer whale or blackfish with the fish and the salmon. And that's the story. Awesome. Thank you so much for uh, reading that for us, Megan. It's so nice to have someone else read. <laughs> um, but thank you. I always enjoy reading those stories to kind of hear like what the history of our clans are. It's such an interesting conversation to have because at one point we did have like eight clans supposedly and um, pandemic wiped out two two of the two possibly three of those clans so what we have left of our clans i think is a powerful representation of our resiliency as as a community as as an indigenous community and the fact that we still can say that we practice our feasting is i think a an amazing feat considering what our people all over have been put up against i was really shocked to hear that some of our neighboring nations still feast in private because it's still the, the laws haven't been lifted in their areas to, to not practice their feasting. So it's always interesting to hear the, the history of how we came to be in our feast hall and why those, I always wondered why the Raven clan worked with the Beaver clan. And I thought it was because there was not enough Ravens. I thought that was the main reason why we worked together. Um, and then also um, I had an interesting conversation with uh, Joe Starr the other day, and we were talking about the differences between the blackfish and killer whale and salmon clans, because there's, con there's, there's a lot of people who identify as saying they're from the killer whale clan, and Joe was saying the killer whale clan actually didn't exist for our community. It was actually just a blackfish, and the blackfish are significantly different than a killer whale. And they're more specific to our area. That's why we had a clan around it was because they're a smaller fish and they're kind of more inland than killer whales are. So I thought that was really interesting because I always just assumed that the blackfish and the killer whale were, were one and the same. I thought they were the exact same species, but apparently they're not. Um, so we were having that discussion because I was saying, well, what is the truth then? Like, is Hulkinuk? actually killer whale or does that mean blackfish and he was saying that it's blackfish so, so uh, it, it's really confusing to me <laughs> like i wonder where people kind of got mixed up with that because all if you ask a younger person what clan they're from and they're from the from the blackfish clan or killer whale clan they'll say killer whale but i'll ask my dad you know who's a few generations back I'll ask him, if you ask him what clan he's in, he'll tell you blackfish, which I think is interesting. One thing I heard on that one, Teresa, was the blackfish, a lot of their people have come from the, the NAS. They actually have a coho that stays in the river through the winter and it turns completely black. And I think the other whale comes from the Hainoxula part. Um, I'm not, 100% on that. It's just theories that I have, but I'm pretty sure that's where the killer whale clan comes from was there. And I think through the amalgamation, that's where we could have lost a couple things. Yeah, yeah, definitely a lot of information was lost in, in that time frame. Um, so we're getting pretty near to the end of the, our gathering today, and I will be uploading uh, sessions from last week. I just didn't get to it last week, but I'll upload last week's session and I'll upload this week's session today. 
so that anybody who can't make it to these gatherings can follow up and, and view the video uh, whenever they can, whenever they have time for it. And if anyone wants access to all of our Zoom me meetings, I have them on my laptop computer and I can email them out to anyone that's interested. Uh, as mentioned before, I'm really uncertain about keeping that information there for public all the time, just because of some of the things that we share in our gatherings It might not want, some people might not agree with sharing it widely. Right now, other than uh, so the next part, um, we've been trying to cover a lot of different things um, with with these gatherings that we have. So the next part is a uh, focus and discussion around traditional plants. And today's uh, topic, and I better double check so I don't get them mixed up again. Um, today's topic is Oaksley, Indian Hilabore. And yeah, we have Dustin here to chat about it. I know Minnie has gone out for multiple harvesting gatherings uh, with, with people and has probably picked up a lot of knowledge about it herself. Um, and many of you have probably grown up with this around you in your life um, and, and might know some information about it. You jump in whenever you, you can or if you have information to share. This is just kind of like an open and formal conversation we wanted to have about our medicines. So I'll let Dustin kick things off with sharing what he knows about Oaksley and what it means to our people and the uses that, that it has. All right. Yeah. It's, all right. This is, uh, can you see that? This is some of the Oaksley I harvested last year. Um, you can see how long the roots are. So when when I personally go out and harvest, this will be early spring when the medicine's still in the roots and then late in the fall, right before the plant falls. And the thought behind that is when the plant is falling, all the energy, because it's a perennial, it'll grow back year after year. So when the plant falls, all that energy goes back into here. Now, what we... This is probably only one of the plants that I know that we hold sacredly, like super sacred. Um, when I harvest, I have a lot of precautions behind it. This is the second most toxic plant in North America, second only to water hemlock. Um, if you're familiar with water hemlock, that's what Socrates um, got poisoned by. So this one, well, my baba said when they were in Kitwanga, a guy up there had a pig farm. I'm not too sure if you see, he took a piece of this root, the length of my fingernail, fed it to the pig, and the pig died in front of their eyes. So he wanted to show to them exactly how poisonous it was. I've witnessed my grandmother just in the end of uh, when I was taking care of her through the last couple years of her life there. She would take this piece of root right at the bottom and put it under her tongue. Now, I'm going to caution everybody, I would not try that. Um, this is what I would call a master plant. Uh, you can go out and harvest all the other medicines, but when it comes to this, it was basically strict. Like when I harvested, I talk to the plant, tell them what it's for, who it's going to. I always gift mine away to people that need it. But it was told to me that they grow in family structures. So where you see one of them, you might see a patch of five. I might take two out of that patch because to me, it's two family members. I talk to the plant, tell them who it's going for, and basically I've gifted almost all my Oaksley away except this piece from last year. Uh, last year I went out quite a bit. There was something inside me kept telling me this might be the year, this might be the year we need it, and before you know it, we're sitting in a COVID world. Um, the only cure for tuberculosis ever in history outside medical science comes from a medicine man in the Heisla Nation. You could find that information on Google as well. He was released from hospital in Vancouver and he was sent home to die. When he got home, one of his relatives told him, you've tried their way, now it's time to try ours. They took the piece of Oxley, put it under his tongue, and he was told to spit it. Keep spitting, never swallow. Um, so what that tells me, underneath your tongue, you have a direct link in your salivary glands that goes directly to your bloodstream. So whatever 
whatever medicine they were taking in was going directly in their blood and they would spit the rest of it out. This is a practice that is uh, long lost. I would not try it unless we were maybe in a neighboring nation where they still have this as common knowledge. But the people that I know, there's not too many people that even know how to properly use it, let alone um, harvesting and stuff. When I harvest, I dig a hole probably three feet by three feet, and I dig it as far down as the roots go, and then I topple it. I was told if you grab it and rip it out, basically you're cursing, you're cursing your family and and the plant. Um, it's bad luck to do that. I was told, but I'm not the ultimate authority. I'm just telling you guys what I was taught. Um, I've seen people harvest it through the summer. So last year I decided, well, I want to see if I can. I harvested one of them through the middle of the summer. And what happened was I noticed that on these, on these roots up at the top, they're really dry, skinny, and brittle compared to the ones I harvested at the end of the year. Um, the reason we harvest it at the end of the year, like I told you earlier, all the chi goes down there. So all that medicine goes in there. That's the most potent time to get it. Uh, what we use it for is, I'll, I'll tell you a story my grandmother told me when she was burying bodies when the last pandem pandemic came around. She was burying bodies and those people would grab a little piece of the oxley, take it off take a little piece about this side and pin it on the inside of their clothes. All the people that had the Oaksley pinned on the inside of their clothes never got sick and they're burying so many people. Um, that's what my grandmother attributes to her. And then her great grandfather, John Bolton, he was actually the first person to climb Mount Elizabeth when they um, renamed that one Bolton mountain. He was telling her to take these bottom ones so I was, I got curious why the bottom roots. So I started looking it up when the bottom roots go down at the tips, they search for water. So there's not a chemical makeup in there really. But again, that's, it's not something, this stuff is very, very toxic. I, I would not experiment with it unless, uh, unless my life was on the line. But other than that, um, it's, a uh, it's a lost, lost medicine. Uh, another story I have about it, um, Potty Jr. was hiking up in the Kitlope where he came across what it looked like a mimicked small cornfield. That's when I told him these things are perennial, so every year they grow back, and those are probably the same Oaksley that maybe a certain family, maybe a medicine man had planted to harvest for his people. Um, when we're getting Hinala, Hinala sued, um, the way I was taught to use this is I take it, I've, I've come to many people's houses to do this. I actually get called upon and I make it so whatever I put it in will smoke everywhere. I close every window in my house. I open up every drawer, like your spoon drawer, right into your um, your fridge. Open the fridge with the doors. You start at the bottom and work your way up to the top while you smoke it. Right into your attic is the last place. You let the smoke stay in there for as long as you can and open one exit, and that's when the ghosts will leave. Uh, <clears throat> this one time I did it, this person had a really bad ghost in their house and I came to their house and it was almost like a picture off the wall was getting ripped off but it kind of just went like that and the pins at the top held on and it went down I was quite scared I almost wanted to run out of there but I had to finish what I started um, or else that thing would probably follow me home other than that like uh, I really don't teach too much of the spiritual uses on it um, let's say over here because it's such a dangerous plant i don't think people really take into the in in consideration how how dangerous this plant is i've touched it by my hand throughout my whole life i don't know if i've built an immunity to it but a lot of people that i see harvest it with gloves because they're so fearful of the poison in it i have a lot of elders that won't even breathe the smoke in but a couple of medic uh, medicinal uses you could use it for is uh, asthma. You just burn it, breathe it in. It opens up your bronchial tubes. Uh, bronchitis, it'll kill the virus, the bacteria that's growing in your lungs. And this goes with pneumonia as well. I've cured two of my pneumonias with this stuff. 
Um, uh, what I do is I put a bunch of hairs on the stove. I wait till the smoke billows up. I take a towel, put it over, breathe in as much smoke as I can. It really burns bad and you cough, but right when you start coughing, all that mucus and everything starts coming out. It basically cured my fever by the time I was done coughing. I think that's about it I have on that. Um, great tutorials when you're going through. This is uh, one of the books that really got me started when I got back from the Kitlope. This is how I got into a lot of medicine. There is this one. And then I reference YouTube. I do my own research. Uh, this is another great book from Reader's Digest. Can you guys see that? It shows all the different recipes. Um, it goes through different cultures. And I never buy myself anything, but finally, I got this one not too long ago. And this one compares um, a lot of First Nations culture with just every other culture and their uses. So not only do I reference my culture, but I go to like Asian culture, um, East Indians, um, pretty much anyone that gathers medicine and I reference what they use it for. Uh, I'm a really curious person, so I need to know what's what's the science behind it basically. What? Awesome. Does anyone have any questions for Justin about Oaksley and the uses? Um, I, I personally like that you shared that it's probably what Haiza would consider their most sacred medicine. Um, when I spoke to my, gram my grandma about it, she compared it to that of uh, plains people, sage and sweet grass. So that's that's a level that we hold Oaksley up in with with our own people. That's that's exactly the equivalent. It's like our sage. It's our sweet grass. And so one thing on that when sorry when they smudge with that, um, what they're doing behind that. The reason we smudge. Um, I wouldn't call it smudge, more like smoking somebody. If they were near death, what happens is in our culture, they say the portal's open. You were near death, so you have to take your clothes off, and this is what you would smoke yourself off with because your ancestors come to greet you. Um, when you're near death, that portal's open, so you have to get your ancestors away. This is the same reason that when they're burning for people at fires for um, sending food over, they don't like anybody 16 years or under because once the smoke goes on them, they believe that that part of their soul could be taken to the other side where their grandma loves this person so much, they, they've held them. Once the smoke goes over a young person, essentially that person could come and grab them and take that part of their soul and then death is there waiting. So uh, a lot of my stories from elders they've talked about that and not having those young people but my dad uh my dad almost died in a rock truck one time and he called for me to smoke with him you could see the how his hands were shaking how scared he was and when I went over him you could see you could just see what the smoke did for his soul his mind uh that's what he believed in there's another story I have to tell about it where where we suspected someone was using the dark arts or witchcraft, whatever you want to call it. My sister almost got into a car accident on her way home and she called my mom. We stockpile all our Oaksley at my mom's house. So my mom said, come here right away. You got to be smoked off. My sister went in, my mom lit up her Oaksley, smoked her off. And then a car accident happened outside. That guy got taken in a ambulance and you could see his blood outside her place and for me that's telling me my mom smoked that curse off and it was going somewhere and someone took it right outside the house when things like that happen that's uh you know i, I don't need anyone to tell me what i know um, when you're getting into the spiritual world this is something that's going to protect you um like many people a lot of us don't need to be told that the spirit world's there we just grew up with this it's it's uh a lot of common knowledge for us to know that there's there's a spirit world and they go to the other side. Yeah, I'm just touching touching a bit on that, just from what I learned growing up too. Um, when we would, when there was an elder, say an older person that was we we knew that was in the hospital, preparing for their journey to the after the afterlife. 
um, as young kids, you know, you feel that energy. And if you grew up in the community, you'd know what I, like, you'll know what I'm talking about. There's a somberness that comes over our community when we know that someone's preparing to leave this world. And um, I remember feeling that very, like, significantly as a child. And I think it's because of where I grew up. For those of you who don't know, my parents' house is literally just down the road from our cemetery. And now the cemetery, the new cemetery is right outside their house, like right in their backyard. So we feel it all. We, we felt every single death in our community at such a magnitude I can't even describe. So we would get penal at a lot in our house. Um, not not a incredible a lot of times, but we would notice things. So my mom would always make a little pouch out of material and I didn't know what she was putting in that pouch at the time, but it was Oaksley. And it was, she would make a little pouch, she would include a safety pin on there and she would pin it to the inside of my clothes. And I would wear it with me probably for like a week or so. And then she would make a new one or she would change it. She would change the medicine in there and she would put fresh medicine in there for me. And it was just something I grew up having and something that I've started to do with my own family and, and with my daughter Lyric because she's very, receptive to those energies as well I think a lot of our kids are. and um, the change that it gives your your the way you feel about things it, it really does help so if you do have Oaksley in your house and if you ever feel unsettled or like you feel like there's a presence that's around you it's definitely one way to really ground ground your own energy to kind of you know if it's a, if it's a negative energy in your home then it will definitely get rid of that um, I can attest to what Dustin has shared about uh, coming and smoking out a house. He's come to my house many times to help me out when um, I was feeling negative energies or presences in our homes. And I truly believe in it, but I think it's something that you definitely have to have a belief system around as well, too. Um, so thank you for sharing that. I mean, it's it's always interesting to hear different perspectives and even just how people grew up with it differently um and, and have their own different teachings so thank you for sharing that uh one at the one i forgot one thing the modern uses they actually use this for almost all bc apple orchards they grind it into a powder since nothing likes this it's so poisonous uh they grind it down to a powder so when you see the plane spraying that's what it is it's oxley uh, Indian hellebore so three days in direct sunlight that's why I never ha uh, hang mine in direct sunlight I hang it in a dry dark place it'll kill the poison in the inside of it so you could actually eat it with three days of direct sunlight after so um, basically any BC apple you've eaten that's what the pesticides they use on it wow that's crazy interesting to know too and if anyone, um, if they're too shy to ask me questions, I always make myself available for anyone. Um, spirituality, uh, learning medicines and stuff. If you're sick, need a uh, helping hand. Uh, not only myself, my sister's always available. She has a lot more teachings for the female. I've never been a female, so <laughs> it's a lot better coming from her. Uh, mine, mine are more directed towards the, the male where she has a lot of teachings towards the female body. Thanks for that, Dustin. That's really helpful insight around that. <laughs> um, that pretty much concludes our gathering for today. Oh, I did want to share actually, because I've been uh, focusing a little bit more on language at home and learning at home. Um, I've been trying to create my own teaching tools at home. So I've been using little index cards to write down proper spelling and pronunciations. I'm also including my own phonetic spelling as well too. Hold on. Um, so, yauts, hello, hi, ixnakwa, good morning. Ixkolasusa. Is your condition good? Um, yes or no? Answer to that would be enough ich glaskens. Yes, my condition is good. Um, I also write down the definitions there that are really helpful. 
x squalus is what um, is goodbye to one person and it's said by the person who's leaving which i didn't know um x squalus is goodbye to multiple people by the one who's leaving so if i were to say goodbye to you guys today i would say x squalus uh, as the person who's leaving to multiple people um, I don't know how to pronounce this word, but I just by af like after reading the and following Ab's videos, I've kind of been able to try pronounce this on my own. Um, yeah, cool. Um, that means that's that's goodbye as well, but it's said to the person who's leaving. Echem dietz Right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Ex ganuch. Good night. One thing you might hear commonly from elders is anguas. <laughs> and that's the exact tone they'll say it in. Anguas. Like I've actually been, I've had elders say that to me before. And it just tickled me pink to be able to say, Teresa Kilisunukwa <laughs> in reply. <laughs> um, I actually said that to Baba Cecil one day and he was just so happy that I replied to him in Haisla. But he was the one who said that to me. Anguas, who are you? Um, Anguatlas, I might've mispronounced that one. Anguatlas, what are you called? So I guess um, Teresa Kilisu Nugwa would be the more appropriate reply to that because that's the reply saying um, Teresa Kilisu Nugwa is Teresa I am called. That's the actual translation of it. Um, and a reply you could have to Anguas is uh, Teresa T Nugwa, which is, oh no, wait, no, I think it's Nug. Trisati, that's how you'd reply to that. So you would take your name instead. And if you're a female, you'd apply T to the end. And if you're a male, it would be D at the end. So it would be Dustin T. Nugwa. That's, that's not quite accurate. Um, it's T depending, T or D depends on what letter or what sound your name ends with. Hmm. So it's D if your name ends with, um, an X, or there's, I think there's three letters. There's three specific letters. I can't recall off the top of my head. Oh, okay. But, uh, so if, you're, if your name ends in a specific letter, then it, it'll be D. But for most letters, it'll be T. Oh, really? That's interesting. Um, I wish we had Vera online, because it was her teaching that she said that female was T and male was D, is what you would add to the end of it. But that's interesting. I'll, I'll have to relook at that one then. So yeah, I just wanted to share my index cards and what's helping me learn at home. Um, because I think language learning, you need to take a bunch of different approaches. Um, and, and navigating what way is the right way is very problematic for us. So um, trying to figure out ways that work for everyone is Reading and writing is one part of it. Hearing a fluent speaker is another part of it. And understanding the mechanics and the orthography is, is, is all parts and pieces of the puzzle that we need to kind of bring together to get a good understanding of our, our language and culture. But I thank you all for being here today. Oh, yeah, Minnie? <laughs> that last workshop I attended in Vancouver, they were talking about like a lot of this, like how our language is changing all the time. Mm -hmm. And there's two communities. I've got it in my notes, but they said the only the only letters and vowels or whatever, they just put it all together that they don't use is no. No isn't in our language because they don't want to say that when people correct each other. But yeah, that's the only thing. I like how they do that. Yeah, 
Maybe that's something. They have it on the door. Oh, cool. They have it on the door. The only word that's not allowed to be carried in here is no. Hmm. That's really good. I mean, I, I'd like to hear what, what makes you comfortable as a learner? Mm -hmm. What will help you come out to our gatherings? What will help you learn our language in a safe manner? And what will, um, what will contribute to you learning? Um, because I agree, you know, like one of the hardest mm -hmm. things for people is when they get corrected. Um, sometimes it's not done in the most uh, kind way. Yeah. And, and I've, I've been corrected and I've been hit with criticisms like pretty bad. And mm -hmm. for me, I've learned to be able to kind of just accept it and move forward. However, I understand that not everyone can do no. that. And I don't expect no. everyone to. So maybe that's something that I'd like to ask from the group and people participating is what what kind of learning atmosphere makes it um, a good environment for you to learn in? Like what can we do to provide a safe learning environment for you? And that could be just, you know, gentle suggestions like, okay, um, we won't use the term no. Uh, we will only just, I don't know. If we can come up with, with things that make us feel safe to learn in, I'd love to hear that from you. But we're five minutes over time, guys. <laughs> but um, I really appreciate you guys coming out again. Uh, this is the third week we've held this. Um, we'll be back probably every Monday, I think. Um, mm -hmm keeping this going, keeping the momentum going with, with this gathering. So again, uh, we're open to suggestions. If you came here in search of something we didn't cover and you want to see it happen or you want to see it shared for the next one or future gatherings, let us know. Um, we do create this within mind of everybody and where they're at in their learning and we want to make it approachable for everyone. So your feedback is important to us and yeah, I look forward to seeing you guys weekly and thank you again for your participation. Thank you. Exquiguelas. Exquiguelas. Exquiguelas.